I would want to welcome you to our presentation today. My name is Paul Mpalawe. I'm a certified chartered accountant and a member of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, CCA. And today I'm going to take you through a business combination as the IFRS3. And uh, basically, our discussion today, we're going to zero in on the following key learning objectives. Number one, we're gonna see an overview of business combination, uh, followed by the background and scope of IFRS 3. Then we're going to see the account treatment in terms of the acquisition method. And uh, later we're gonna see the disclosures if time allows. Okay. So, in the case to understanding the standard IFRS 3, there are things that we need to put into consideration, uh, the steps that we need to understand. Whenever there is a business combination, we should first of all identify the acquirer and account for business combination transactions separately from related transactions. So who is the acquirer? As previously discussed, the acquirer is the entity that obtains control. So in terms of the aspect of control, we already discussed in our previous video. If you haven't watched it, you better watch the one for introduction to business combination where we discussed more on the aspect of control and um, step number two you have to identify the acquisition date the acquisition date is a date in which the acquirer uh, has taken control okay of the operations basically so step number three you need to check the consideration transfer. So basically the consideration transfer is amount of money in cash and kind uh, that is transferred to the transferee or the entity that is being acquired. So you have to use the fair values at acquisition date, okay? And you also have to check the costs that are directly attributable to, to uh, part of the business combination. This cost may be the cost of uh, the legal costs. Okay, those are part of the costs that um, they are classified as uh, the business combination cost. So depending on the agreement between the acquirer and the acquiree you also have to take into consideration how you're going to treat those costs. Okay. And um, consideration can also be in terms of um, the contingent consideration, which is um, termed as future consideration, where the acquirer agrees with the acquiry to say, um, for example, they, they would say that, um, or they might say that if profit increases by 10%, the acquirer is gonna pay a certain amount of money uh, to add up to the initial consideration in cash that is, um, that is paid currently, okay? And uh, on the aspect of consideration, uh, there might also be an agreement of share exchange where the acquirer would, uh, would 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 put up shares in comparison to the existing shares of the acquiry. Okay. Step number four, you have to identify the assets and liabilities. Assets and liabilities that are recognized separately out of goodwill. And um, you also have to check if there were any assets 
that are understated in the process. An examiner would give you a note to say such, such asset or land or buildings or, or wasn't considered or wasn't part of the initial uh, amount of net assets. So you need to make adjustments on the fair values. So largely you have to measure the net assets at fair value on the acquisition date. We discussed this uh, area to say, when you want to calculate goodwill, you need to check, um, you need to quantify the assets and liabilities at the date of acquisition and assets and liabilities at the date of re reporting. Then you need to check the movement in between, but largely you take the assets and liabilities at all the net assets in short at the date uh, of the acquisition. Later, you're going to see uh, the meaning of date of acquisition uh, in our discussion. So key points to take note. These are critical points that we should take note. Okay. Number one, Business combination is a purchase of shares of another entity. That's the first point. Okay. Secondly, whilst IFRS 3 deals with the initial accounting treatment of subsidiary by the acquirer on the date of acquisition, the standard IFRS 10 deals with the consolidation process and procedures that uh, take place after the acquisition date. So IFRS 3 is only talking about the treatment of the subsidiary by the acquirer on that date of acquisition. While uh, the other standard that we discussed earlier, IFRS 10 deals with the process of consideration. So we shouldn't confuse the two. And uh, once the business combination has been accounted for in terms of IFRS 3, IFRS 10 chips in, and this standard will be used to apply uh, the consolidation process when at the date of acquisition. So we are emphasizing on that point for you to remember. Okay, so a business combination transaction may take place between shareholders of the combining entities or between one entity and the shareholders of another entity. So depending on the case or depending on the scenario, we also have to understand. So IFRS 3 does not apply in the following. Number one, the formation of joint arrangement. Uh, joint issues to do with joint arrangement and uh, joint venture. They are prescribed in the IFRS 11. That's a special standard that we're going to discuss later. So same with the business combination. That is not discussed under IFRS 3. That is uh, dealt with or discussed, uh, prescribed in IFRS 11. So the same with acquisition of assets that do not constitute a business combination or that do not constitute a business in, to, to the large extent. So when an entity obtains control of entities or one entity that are not businesses, the process cannot be constituted and uh, uh, cannot be regarded as a business combination. That's something else. So when net assets that are not a business are, are acquired, this standard does not apply and uh, the reporting entity would account for it as an asset acquisition. So we've provided an example of how that can be accounted for. Okay, so acquisition date. What is an acquisition date? We're talking about business combination and uh, we cannot skip the aspect of uh, acquisition date. So acquisition date is a date on which control of the net assets and the operations of the acquiree 
or an entity that is being acquired are effectively transferred to the acquirer or the entity that is acquiring shares. That is the date from which the investor is exposed to, number one, rights and obligations. Number two, variable returns from its involvement with the investee and has the ability to affect those returns through its power over the investee. Or in other words, the investor has the right to access the profits or to direct how the business operations should take place. Because at this point, the acquirer has paid the consideration and the agreement has been signed. The risks and rewards have been transferred from the acquiree to the acquirer. That is acquisition date. Okay, so largely it is important to determine the acquisition date. Why? Uh, because it is the date on which the fair value of consideration transferred in the business combination and the fair value of the identifiable assets and liabilities will be measured. So it is also the date from which the results of the acquiree will be incorporated into the consolidated financial statements of the acquirer. That is the whole reason why the goodwill is calculated on the date of acquisition. Okay, so if control is obtained in a single transition, the acquisition date and the closing date normally coincide, but uh, it is not necessarily the case. An acquirer shall consider all facts and circumstances uh, given uh, the date when the contract was approved or the agreement was approved between the acquirer and the acquiree. So in the case to identifying the acquisition date. Sometimes the acquisition date is silent. In such a case, you check the date when the contract was signed or the contract was approved. That, my friends, is termed, is taken as the acquisition date. So if a business combination is achieved through a series of successive share purchases, there will be various states on which the consideration were exchanged. Okay, in such cases, sometimes um, money might not be enough from the acquirer to satisfy the obligation agreed. It may be paid in bits and pieces. So in this case, uh, given that such, such a case, the acquisition date is a date on which the block of shares that final results in control of the acquiry is purchased. If today the acquirer purchases 20% of the shares, then the next day he purchases 15%. Uh, up until the aspect of control, the amount of shares that are, that guides the acquirer to have control over the acquiree, such a date is considered as the date of acquisition. Okay. Another aspect that we need to understand is an aspect of uh, consideration transfer. So basically, consideration transfer is the sum of the acquisition date fair values of assets transferred and the liabilities incurred by the acquirer to the former owners of the acquiry and the equity interest issued by the acquirer to the former owners of the acquiry, except for the measurement of share base payment. So in short, consideration transfer is an agreed amount of money, whether in cash or future contingent consideration or share-based payments. That may be paid at some point to the acquiry or an entity being acquired. That, my friends, is consideration transfer. And that is a key element when you are calculating goodwill. Okay. 
So consideration transfer can either be on cash, deferred payment, or share-based payment, or in other words, share exchange. We are going to try to find examples uh, that may explain all this uh, narrative. Okay. As from the acquisition date, an acquirer should incorporate the results of the operation of the acquiree and any gain or bargain purchase into statement of profit or loss and the other comprehensive income. What do we mean? Later, we're going to discuss on how a combination of uh, profit and loss between the uh, parent company and subsidiary may be accounted for. So this has to start from the date when the acquirer has control over the acquiree. Nothing else is not discussed under this standard. Okay. Number two. <clears throat> At such a date, the acquirer has to recognize the assets and liabilities of the acquiree. Number one, any issues to do with non-controlling interest. Number two, and any goodwill arising on the acquisition date. This has to be recognized in the statement of financial position. Point number three to take note is that after making a consideration and after the acquirer acquires the shares of the acquiree, that's a date when the acquirer has to recognize cash flow, the cash in and the outflow of the acquiree to incorporate it in the consolidated statements of cash flow. So there are four statements that need to be prepared. Statement of financial position, a consolidated statement of financial position, consolidated statement of income, and a consolidated cash flow, as well as a consolidated changes in equity. Okay, bits by bits, we're gonna see how best you can do that. So recognition of specific identifiable assets and liabilities, <clears throat> sorry. As of the acquisition date, the parent company or the acquirer shall recognize the identifiable assets acquired and liabilities assumed in the business combination separately from the goodwill. That's when we discussed area about adding assets of the parent and assets of the assets of the uh, subsidiary, same with uh, liabilities, and checking if there, there were any intercompany balances at the year end. So assets that are not recognized under goodwill, or net assets that are not recognized under goodwill, shall be uh, done on the addition aspect of line by line, as prescribed by IFRS 10, okay? So in order for the identifiable assets and liabilities to be recognized as per IFRS 3, they are must first meet the definition of assets and liabilities as contained in the conceptual framework or as contained in IS 16, in short, okay? Second, they must be part of what the acquirer and the acquiree exchanged in the business combination transaction rather than the result of a separate transaction. They are, must be part of the agreement to say the least, okay? So the identifiable assets acquired and the liabilities assumed and uh, contingent liabilities to be organized and measured are therefore those of the acquiree that existed as at the acquisition date. So you see how important it is to identify the acquisition date. So assets and liabilities that were agreed as part of the combination process must be organized, must be identified at such a date. Okay. 
So liabilities are not recognized as part of the fair value exercise if they result from the acquirer's intention of future actions because they did not exist at the date of acquisition. Anything outside the agreement, we are not taking any future losses because future losses and future profits are not part of the agreement now unless they are contingent. Okay, unless their effect in the future is as a result of an event that has happened now. Other than that, they are not part of the uh, process. Uh, restructuring provision can therefore be recognized only if it is an existing liability in terms of uh, IS 37, that is provision contingent liabilities and contingent assets as prescribed by the conceptual framework. Okay, so we've talked about contingent consideration as part of the consideration transfer. Sometimes there may be a contingent consideration. So the big question is, what is contingent consideration? What is contingent consideration? Okay. The standard defines contingent consideration as an obligation of the acquirer to transfer additional assets or equity interests to the former owners of the business or the former owners of the acquiree as a part of the acquisition of control of an acquiree if we specify the future events occur or conditions are met. So as area gave an example of, uh, let's say you want to buy shares in a company and uh, there's an agreement in between you as acquirer, parent company and a subsidiary to say if the subsidiary makes, if the subsidiary's profits increased in the year by 20%, for example, then the acquirer, the parent company, shall pay an additional amount of uh, so, 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 let's say $20 million. That is contingent. Something has to happen if something happens. So if the company fails to make uh, profits of more than 20%, then the acquirer shall not pay that contingent. So how do we account for such? we'll see how best possible uh, that can be done. So a contingent consideration may also give the acquirer the right to the return of the previously transferred consideration if specified conditions are met, okay? Contingent consideration arrangements may sometimes be an inherent part of the economic consideration in the negotiation between the buyer and the seller. The two parties may, for example, agree that the buyer will make an additional payment as I read it earlier, if a specified earnings level is achieved at an agreed date and um, after the business combination has already taken place. So the contingent consideration is dependent on future events for sure. And the acquirer's agreements to make contingent payments is an, obli is an obligation or in an obligating event in a business combination transaction. So, although the amount of the future payments the acquirer will make is dependent on, on, uh, on upon the future events, the obligation to make them if the specified future event occur is unconditional, regardless of, as long as there is an agreement, okay? So in an exam, if you're given uh, a future consideration like that, what do you do? Most of the time, this is a future amount. Okay, let's say uh, the agreement is to pay twenty million dollars. Today is uh, 20, 2023. The agreement is to pay an addition of twenty million dollars in twenty twenty five. Okay, two years after. If within the two years, the, the company makes a 10% increase in profits. So if that event occurs, that 20 million is in the future. 
Okay, so we need to discount that amount to the present. So we use a discounting factor. How do you get a discounting factor? We may be given in an in a exam, but most of the times is uh, connected to the cost of capital. Okay, so where we say our present value is equal to its equivalent to um, the future value divided by one plus R to the power N, where R is the rate of interest and the N is the time in value. So in this case, it's gonna be two years. So you need to discount that at a discounting rate of say 10% if, if the cost of capital is 10%. Okay, let us have we'll check if we've got a question like that and um, check and try to calculate and um, bring it to our attention how best we can, we, we can find answers to such kind of questions. Okay. An example, acquisition of a group of assets that does not meet the definition of business combination. That does not meet. Let's see how, how that question can come. Suppose PJ Limited acquired the following assets of Trossard Limited for $10 million. Okay. The assets, uh, property plan equipment with book value of 3,850,000. I hope these are quatches. And at the same time, market value is uh, 4,550,000. And that represents 70% of the total assets. Same with inventory, 1.1 million and uh, market value, 1.3 million. Receivables, 550,000 book value and market value. Is 650,000. The total for book value of these assets, 5.5 million. And the market value for the same is uh, 6.5 million. Given a question like this, and if the acquisition of the group of assets does not meet the definition of business combination as prescribed by IFRS3, what should you do? What should you do? Okay. Um, there's an amount here of 10 million. That's your consideration transferred, okay? Or amount that you paid to acquire these assets. So the big question is, which amounts are you going to use? Because this, uh, we have already been told that this does not meet the definition of business combination. So how are you going to account this 10 million? This 10 million will be divided among these assets with the relative percentage. So for property plan and equipment, it's gonna be 70% of 10 million. For inventory, it's gonna be 20% of 10 million. And for receivables, it's gonna be 10% of 10 million. Why? Because the agreement does not meet a business combination. Shall the agreement meet the definition of business combination, then the 10 million would have been the consideration transferred. And you could have seen uh, how the NCI was measured at the date of acquisition, plus the NCI, then minus the market values. Because market values are termed as the fair values. Why fair values? That's IFRS 13, fair value measurements. Input number one. There's input number one, input number two, and input number three. Fair values for the ones that are traded on uh, uh, the market, the, or the agreed market values, input number one. All right. So, on the next slide, I'm showing how we can account that 10 million. As I already said, the 10 million would be divided using the relative share. So 10% of 10 million, 7 million. Same with 20% of 10 million, 2 million. 
and 10% of 10 million, 1 million. So how, uh, how are you gonna show the double, the double entry or the journal in the books of the parent company, PG? So we're gonna debit plant 7 million, even to 2 million and receivables uh, 1 million with a credit entry going to the bank as payment was made out of the bank. It's as simple as that. Okay. Should same taking same example, taking same example, and assuming that the agreement now meets does meet the definition of business combination, and assuming that NCI has rate of acquisition was one million with the same assets that were given previously with the same relative percentage. The solution would have been different where consideration transfer 10 million amount that was paid. Okay. Then we add NCI at acquisition 1 million. Then we reduce with the net assets of Trossard at the date of, of acquisition, 6.5 million. Then the good deal that would have been made on the date of acquisition was supposed to be 4 point five million. I hope my friends, this makes sense. It's as easy as that. Okay, this is a basic understanding of IFRS three. Basically the basic. Okay, so in summary, what are we saying? IFRS three, uh, talks about the recognition principle where we said all identifiable assets acquired and the liabilities assumed, they must be recognized. If they meet the definition of assets and the liabilities in the conceptual form. No, don't just add things. Check, do they fit the definition of IS-16? Okay. So if you don't know IS 16, you gotta go back and you know and 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 study and read what IS 16 talks about. So basically the exception of recognition principle is on contingent liabilities. Where are we saying contingent liabilities are not accounted for in as far as business combination is concerned? Okay, because there are future events. They are contingent. They are attached to something happening. So they're outside the agreement of the business combination. So in summary also, the standard talks about the measurement principle where it says all identifiable assets acquired and the liabilities assumed are measured at the acquisition date using fair Values. What is a fair value? Is a market value. The value at which the market is exchanging in simplest terms, the agreed amount at which the market is the normal market is changing. So exceptions to the measurement principle, reacquired rights share-based transactions, non-current assets held for sale. These are exceptions. My friends, I think we should stop there for now until next time when we are gonna come with more examples on the consolidation process as I, as I promised earlier that um, next time we're gonna do uh, complex group 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 accounts or complex uh, consolidation, where we're going to see um, if the company acquires two or more three subsidiaries, how is that accounted for? If the company has a step acquisition in the process, how is that accounted for? And if the company has a disposal, you know sometimes the company would want to dispose or would feel like 
disposing assets or shares at such an event if if the controlling aspect fades away how is um, the gain and the loss accounted for that's basically a complex group of accounts and i'm going to help you understand so that um, you you use that knowledge in exam and after exam you use that knowledge in real life your life accountancy how it works so until next time it's a bye-bye for now